revived their old plot to set an ambush and kill him along the way. Verse 4, Festus answered that Caesarea was the proper jurisdiction for Paul and that he himself was going back there in a few days. You're perfectly welcome, he said, to go along with me and, and accuse him of whatever you think he's done wrong. Now, let's listen to the word accusation here. About eight or ten days later, later, Festus returned to Caesarea. The next morning, they took their place in the courtroom and had Paul brought in. So here's this big moment. The minute he walked in, okay, not, they didn't even just wait. The minute he walked in, the Jews had come down, who had come down from Jerusalem were all over him, hurling the most extreme accusations, and none of them they could prove. How do we keep focused on who the Lord is and who we are and this calling that we have in the midst of accusations? Paul the Apostle was struggling, I'm sure, to stay focused, but he was. He was keeping his attention on Christ. And I want to share with you a couple of things that we have to be aware of. Uh, when dealing with accusations. And I don't know, you may have come here today and you're free of any kind of um, bad feelings or bad attitudes toward you from anyone. But I want to, first of all, talk about bad attitudes that you might have toward yourself. Where you would be your hardest and harshest critic. Where you don't give you a break. Where you attack you. self Talk is not necessarily from you, but it's a trick the enemy uses to defeat you and to discourage you and to beat you down. I just want you to know that. You have an enemy today. I don't like, I don't like to talk about the devil very much in church. This is about Jesus, about who he is. But the devil, Jesus said, goes around like a roaring lion, lion, <laughs> lion seeing who he can devour and, and to deceive, Okay. So I want to just talk to you today about the first point is this. It sounds like self-talk, but it's coming from the pit of hell. Can I just explain that to you? It's tough to be accused when you don't deserve it. Has anybody been falsely accused? Okay. Has anybody been accused and it was right on the money? <laughs> yeah, me too. It's just how it is. Okay. Uh, I was accused falsely. I, I don't know, some of you know this story, but I was uh, 11 years old at Vacation Bible School at the Conrad Baptist Church, Southern Baptist. I don't know why it was Southern Baptist and way up there in Montana, but it was uh, the Southern Baptist Church and Pastor Gray was there. Uh, we had some crazy kids, uh, Roger Hicks, Wendell Gaines, and, and uh, Ronnie Gaines, and they were all Tearing around, tearing around downstairs and running in church. Do you remember when running in church was like one of the seven deadly sins? You're not, you're not supposed to run in church because that's like, I don't know, it's just like an evil thing to run in church. And honestly, we weren't very happy in church either. That was also a big uh, thing that we were trying to be. Somber and holy and sad and... and Welcome to church, everybody. And anyway, I was in, and they were running around. Of course, I wasn't. I was a perfect child. And I was going up the stairs, and I was on the landing when right then Roger and Wendell and Ronnie were plowing around me. And at the top of the stairs was Pastor Gray. His name was appropriate, too. Pastor Gray said, you boys, in the coat room. Now, this was a bad day for all of us but especially for me because I was innocent. And he had us go in the coat room. He shut the door behind us. This is, by the way, not quality church discipline. He had us grab our ankles and he pulled a paddle. You know one of those with a hole drilled in it to let the, any possible air that would buffer any pain to escape? And he had us grab our ankles and he swatted each of us. And we were all wailing, of course. Hmm. I still have a problem with Baptists. <laughs> you know, I was just like, to be falsely accused and then punished for it. 
was a bad moment in my life. It was difficult. Well, that happens. But sometimes we falsely accuse ourselves. And I want to deal with that today if we can. I don't know who might be here to have work on that, but I needed work on that. Monday morning, I needed work on that. We, we closed on the Nicholas house, the house we had for international students. And uh, the closing was Monday, which was wonderful because it helped us reduce our church debt load enormously. It really is a great thing. It had served its purpose and time, and it was just the time to do that. All the leaders of that house and the people who have served in it chimed in on an email with me and, and were very supportive and, and grateful for the time God used them. And many students came to Christ through that experience. And we had a closing on Monday. On Friday, I was supposed to get the part from the UPS man. I couldn't find the UPS man. I, I was too busy Friday, and I forgot to wait at the church for the UPS man, or I forgot to leave him a note, please leave the part. And the part went into Salem again and was lost. The closing was Monday. We had to have the part fixed on, we were supposed to have it fixed on Friday or Saturday when Rod got home to fix it. And then it had to be Monday and I couldn't get the part. So I'm in the church parking lot waiting for the UPS man. And I went back into the church and I, I had the trailer hooked up and I decided, you know what, I can't just sit here. And I, I told Judy in the, in the office, I said, I'm going to go look for the UPS man. And so I unhooked my trailer and I started driving up and down the streets and looking for the UPS man. You know, driving and looking and driving and looking. And I saw a UPS truck parked and I pulled in and... Let me back up. Sitting in the parking lot before I decided to go find the UPS man, I was wallowing in self-condemnation. I was sitting there thinking, yeah, I'm a screw up. Why couldn't have I left a note and I could have had this part? And now everybody's texting me and emailing me. We have to move the closing if we don't get this part in. And we'll have to redo all the documents and redo all the numbers. And it was a big pain because I forgot to leave a note for the UPS man. Has, he, has anybody ever wallowed in self-condemnation before? Because I was beating myself up. I had a couple of other events happening that same day. And I was feeling like a loser, you know? I was having a hard time. That's when I got a text from my father-in-law who said to me, your mother-in-law woke up in the middle of the night and she felt these words to say, strong man, you're done. And I felt like I'm supposed to send you this scripture. Isaiah 54:17. Well, I will thwart the accuser. I've got to read that to you. It's too good. He sent me this text Monday sitting in the parking lot when I was wallowing in self-condemnation. No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And it is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Well, it's no big deal. You should feel sorry. You did screw up. You did forget. Yeah. But I was innocent on the stair landing when Pastor Gray caught us. That's what jarred me loose to go look for the UPS man. And so I, I, I thanked him for that. And I, he said, he didn't know any of this was going on at all. And he said, Jose, I just want you to, he calls me Jose when he wants to just 
talk serious. Jose, I just want you to know, I think that's for you. You need to take it and realize that the accuser is the enemy. I said, okay, thank you. I hunted for the UPS man. I found him. And I found him eating lunch. He had just sat down to a nice big sandwich. And I sit down at his table and I said, good morning. I know you probably don't want anybody to interrupt your lunch, but if I buy your lunch, would you mind going in your truck and looking for a package for me? And he looked up and he said, I appreciate your tenacity. <laughs> You're not going to buy my lunch. I said, well, we're closing on a house. Oh, I've done that before. Let me go in there and get the part. And he went in there. Gets the part and comes out. And he kept complimenting me. It got a little embarrassing. About, you're so tenacious. Good job. Way to find me. And blah, 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 blah. It's like, yeah, okay. I don't take compliments that well sometimes. And then I get in the car and I'm driving back to the church. I get a phone call from the real estate agent on the other side of the sale. Is there any chance that part's going to go in? Has, has it been done? Has it been fixed? And I said, I just found the UPS man. I, he was having lunch, and I got the part out of his truck, and we're on our way to fix it. He says this, you, sir, are a man of action. I said, thanks. And then he kept complimenting me. And I had to just kind of like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hang on. It was a little embarrassing. I went over to the hardware store here in Monmouth, and the lady waiting on me complimented me. I was, it was getting embarrassing. Here, let me tell you what happened. I was believing the lies of the enemy, that I was a loser, that I was, deserved all this condemnation. My father-in-law prayed, my mother-in-law prayed, they sent me this note, they didn't know what was going on, but something shifted in heaven. And God started to tell me all day long with weird compliments. 